With all due respect, we shrivel up like cowardice footballers for the next 10 minutes. I think it's I think that's harsh, but I think it's fact. Um, and then we let the UAE back in the game within a matter of minutes, which was very disappointing. Please just win. It could be 1-0 in the 90th minute. It could be 16-0 by halftime. We could win. We could have 50 shots. We could have three shots. We could have 1% possession. We could have 100% possession. Just win the game. I don't care how you do it. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another emergency episode or a off-season episode or a non, non-normal non schedule um, episode of the Two Foot Tackle podcast. I'm your host, Aris Anatakos. Um, I said I'd be back. I, I, I was back literally, I think, a week later. But this is coming out on a Wednesday afternoon, not on a Tuesday morning. So I guess that's my excuse or my justification for um, my slight disappearance. But um, like I said... I will, I will be back in the off season. I'll be sporadically here, and I think this the reason why. And as you can tell by the title and the thumbnail, if you're watching on YouTube, the reason why this podcast exists. But we're here. We're here nonetheless. I've got a slightly creaky voice that still hasn't recovered from some overindulging on the weekend. So if I do just stop talking, or if my voice just stops working halfway through a sentence, then there you go. There's my justification once again. But um, yes, it was a. I mean, there's a, not really a lot to cover. This is going to be a slightly shorter episode because, obviously, I'm only really covering one game. Also, I want to touch on some transfer news, European transfer news at the back end of this podcast, just just because I haven't touched on it in a while, and it's good to catch up on all those things. But we all know the reason why we are. It was the Australia versus UAE game over the weekend, the first round of the Intercontinental Playoff, and... Thank Christ for Adrian Hurstich, I think, is is the main sentiment I've, I've come out of this game with. Um, yeah, so it was Australia 2, the UAE 1, and I just want to do a big, quick review of the game. Now, I woke up at 4, 4 a.m. to see Kyle Rouse, no striker, Craig Goodwin, Bailey Wright, I'm thinking, oh god, this could be a long, long, long morning. But I, as much as I criticise Graham Arnold, as much and as much as I don't think he's fit to be Australia coach, I back the boys, I back the coach, I back the country when when they need backing. So I I felt obliged to not criticise, but just to give my observation and just back the boys. And it was a, I mean. Should, where should we start here? I mean, we, we, let's start with the start of the game. And I was like, all right, we're, we're, we're on here. And that's my the, my immediate thoughts was we're, we're showing something today. Martin Boyle got on the ball really early on, started driving at defenders, started really ex- exploiting the dysfunctionality of the UAE defense at times. And I was like, all right, we're, we're, this is positive start. But positive start, then we, then we started getting Moy on the ball a little bit more. We started, we started breaking through the lines a little bit more. But towards the back end of the second half, it was just not quite there. Something was lacking towards the back end of the second half. And obviously, the second half comes. We start like a house on fire. Jackson over one gets the opening goal. Before we, with all due respect, we shrivel up like cowardice footballers for the next 10 minutes I think it's I think that's harsh but I think it's fact um and then we let the UAE back in the game within a matter of minutes which was very disappointing backs against the wall type operation and it was Adrian Hurstich who who saved our blushes for the millionth time it seems like this qualification campaign with a beautiful strike too powerful too strong and it found its way in the back of the net and we win the game 2-1 meaning we go on to verse Peru on Monday morning to decide our fates, whether or not we're going to the World Cup or whether or not we'll be watching it from home. Now, let's just quick wrap up, wrap up of the game and I want to give my thoughts on my overarching thoughts. Now, I did an article for, for the Inner Sanctum. I did an article for the Inner Sanctum. Um, I did like a preview of this game and outlining what I thought Graham Arnold needed to do. And I'll leave the link to that in the, in the description if you want to read it. Um, I thought that the soccer is needed to really come out in this game and play possession-based football. 
Now, for I mentioned this in the article, but I'll give you a quick footnote version for a couple of reasons. Firstly, if you can put the UAE on the back foot, a side that likes to keep possession, if you can put them on the back foot, then bang, tick, make them uncomfortable, fight fire with fire top operation. And also, it was fucking nothing. It was like 34 degrees in Qatar. And I know they've got the air-conditioned stadium, but let's be honest, that's that's not good. It, it will have an effect, obviously, but it was still 34 degrees. So the worst thing that the Socceroos could do is start playing chasey and start defending and and not and watching other people play football where we've got players that can play football themselves. Now, obviously, I read this article before the news of Adam Taggart and Trent Sainsbury. I didn't have Adam Taggart starting. I did have Jamie McLaren starting, um, and I thought when he came on, he played. For, he he showed some spark. I know he had a chance which he fluffed, but he dropped deep. Was a little bit creative with the way he was making his runs and with the way he was positioning himself. I thought he played very well when he came on. But I th- I had my lineup and was Matt Ryan in goal. Davidson, Atkinson, Sainsbury, Stesnes, Irvine, Moy, Hostich, Boyle, Mobile, McLaren. That was my lineup, and the reason I had that lineup was I thought it was the I thought it was going to be the best lineup, or the the lineup that was able that was going to allow us to keep possession the most. Obviously, Graham Arnold didn't didn't go with that type of approach. He went with the more Maybe not counter-attacking because we still dominated the ball at stages, but it was a much more direct system. It played, and I think I can bring the average positions up right here. It it played very similar to how it's set up. So if you have like 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 this, these average average positions show, it's set up like a four three three, but you've got Boyle pushing really high up, and he was our outlet ball for the most for most of the game. He was the man that whenever he had the ball in his on his, with, whenever we had the ball at his feet, something dangerous was going to happen. We saw, like I said, in the first five minutes, and obviously the first goal came from Martin Boyle brilliance, right? So if we look here, you can see the fullbacks are staying relatively deep. I would and not pretty much the whole back line is staying relatively deep with Aaron Moy being that being that single pivot in midfield. And this is something that I was I noted throughout the game and I tweeted out about at the start of the game. I was very, very, very worried about Aaron Moy playing as a single pivot. Because if you want to play Jackson Irvine, that's fine and I agree I said Jackson Irvine should start. However, they have to play very, very tightly together. Because Aaron Moy doesn't have the legs. He hasn't played a competitive football game in six months. Something like that. He, he, he didn't have the legs to cover the ground. And we saw Nathaniel Atkinson on that right-hand side was getting absolutely torched. He was getting torched all game. And someone like a Jackson Irvine playing is that double pivot, playing next to Aaron Moy, could come across and could help and could be that. Think Jordan Henderson for Trent Alexander-Arnold. Think that. That is the type of role Jackson Irvine needed to play when he played as a double pivot. Now, he played... Slightly more advanced, he played as an eight, and I mean, it did work out. So credit to Arnie there, because he did score the opening goal, and it was a textbook number eight goal. Ball ball goes wide towards the byline, late run into the box, cut back, smashes smashes at home. Textbook number eight goal. So credit to Jackson Irvine for that, and he did provide something attackingly, but I feel like it was at the detriment of our defensive system. Now, if you bring the the average positions up here as well, you see the role of Matt Leckie being as that number nine, which I didn't really understand. Now, obviously, Adam Taggart goes out, and then everyone is screaming, where is the cum dog? Um, where is Jason Cummings? Why wasn't he called up, called up? I was shocked that he wasn't called up, but I also understood the justification for him not being called up. I wanted him to be called up, but... The justification being that he's too similar to McLaren and that we've got Taggart, McLaren, Duke, all very all different different strikers, right? However, when Taggart goes down, the fact that you don't play a number nine, just I was really upset and I thought uh, upset. I was really annoyed um, at that tactical decision for for Graham Arnold not to play a number nine because you see Matt Leckie there, he's kind of floating in no man's land. Um, He's not playing out wide because that's Goodwin's role. He's not playing deep because that's Hustich's role. He's not playing as that furthest, like, forward. That's Martin Boyle's role. So he was kind of loitering and playing 
kind of in the middle of nowhere. He wasn't really doing anything. And that kind of made attacking really difficult because especially for the second half and for the for bits of the first half as well, we were just lumping balls into the box. Now, I have been very vocal about my opinions on Mitchell Duke, but if you're going to launch balls into the box and if you're just going to cross, 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 then, then at least put someone there that can win headers. And I know McLaren isn't tall, but at least he's a number nine. At least he has that striker's instinct. Matt Leckie, kind of floating around in no man's land because, like I said, he didn't really know what his role was. Was it to drop deep? Well, he's obviously not doing that. Was it to push beyond the, behind the the back four? It obviously wasn't his role there because that was obviously Boyle's. Was it to drift out wide? But then you have Goodwin dropping there. You, you're creating that overload in that in that space. It was a little bit confusing, but I I I, I hesitate to criticise too much because we won the game. Now another area which I was really confused was the centre centre half partnership. Um, it was Bailey Wright and Carl Rouse. I like I said I didn't have either of them starting. However, when Sainsbury went down, I thought, all right, you give Bailey Wright this responsibility. However, with the way that the soccer is, especially towards the start of the game, and we'll bring this up here, and you can see by the momentum bar in the bottom left-hand side of the screen, and all the, can I just bear in mind, for audio listeners, I'm showing up a lot of visuals, so if you just want to understand what I'm talking about, just go um, just go and watch the YouTube. But you can see here on the left-hand side the momentum bar, and it was very just nothing was really happening. It was very just kind of just very... Not nothing really going on, especially in the first half. And the reason for this was that no one was able to create anything from deep. Because each defensive line was sitting so far deep that by the time you got the ball forward, teams were, your attack was being swarmed. So you needed someone to create, to break the lines from deep. And Australia had that through Aaron Moy, but he wasn't doing that to his best ability. I thought Adrian Hurstich did that towards the back end of the game. I thought towards towards the last 15 minutes, last 20 minutes, really when Australia started to get some ascendancy in the game, then Hurstich started dictating a little bit more. But this was a game for Yanis Desnes, and I don't understand why he hasn't been given an opportunity. He's been played as a midfielder before for the Socceroos, which is clearly not his role, clearly not his role, and he would have been the perfect centre-half partner to, at for the circumstances that fell Bailey Wright. Because Bailey Wright and Kyle Rouse aren't confident in possession. We saw a couple of times the ball be passed from centre half to centre half to centre half to full back, back to centre half, and then Bailey Wright would just kick it long and hope someone could get onto it. Now, that isn't going to win you football games. Sorry, I just put my camera back in focus. That isn't going to win you football games, especially against a side that sits deep. You need someone that can pick the ball up, be confident in possession, and then spear that pass in between the lines to someone like a Hurstich, to someone like a Lecky, or to a Boyle who can get onto the ball and then drive. Because we were just very stagnant. It was very pass, 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 either cross or long ball or channel ball. And I didn't mind the channel balls in the beginning. Oh, we got Goodwin, Goodwin into some space. We got Boyle into some space early on with the channel balls. But they snuffed that out pretty quickly, and then we didn't really have a plan B, um, especially in the first half. I want to bring up the average positions once more to just show show something which I which I noticed, and you can see it's very it's a four three three, and I was shocked by this. I was utterly shocked that we played a four three three because we don't really like to play that system, especially with Aaron Moy playing as that single pivot in midfield. There is there is snapshots on the game, and I don't have it here with me. But there are snapshots of the game on Twitter where Aaron Moy picks up the ball and there is no one, no one near him, which doesn't suit him, doesn't suit his role because he can't run, so he needs players next to him, and that for me caused a major threat on the counter for them. And I think you can see down on the right hand side the gap that Nathaniel Atkinson is giving to to the UAE and we have Harib Abdullah who had one of the best games I've ever seen a, a, a player play. He had seven dribbles, ju- seven dribble attempts and four of them were succeeded as um, Sofa School refreshes there for me. But you can see there that he was really, really the the player 
for the UAE. He was really the player that was able to get onto the ball. He had three shots on target, all from very, very similar areas, coming across behind Atkinson and behind Bailey Wright, and really coming from that right half space, but really pushed up onto the onto the byline. And it was something that I was quite blatantly obvious in the first half because you can see the gap there between Atkinson and, and Bailey and Bailey Wright. You can see that gap into that quadrant behind them. It was something that was so blatantly obvious within the first 10 minutes, within the first 15 minutes. And Graham Arnold's persistence to, to maintain that back four and that shape really confused me. Now, I had Atkinson starting, but I obviously had Atkinson starting on the basis that we would be able to keep possession more than we did. Um, if we if we go back here, you can see that the UAE, if we just go down here, the UAE had 55% possession, had more passes, um, like comfortably more passes as well. We, whereas we relied more on the long ball and relied more on the, on the cross and driving at, at, at the defence. If you're going to play this defensive system where your fullbacks don't push up, you play Kragic. This was the game for Kragic. I thought it was the wrong system for the wrong player. If you're going to play attacking, if you're going to play progressive, if you're going to get your fullbacks high up the pitch, then Atkinson is your man. If you're going to play a system which relies on a flat back four or even a flat flat back five and being defensively solid and then being able to play through the middle of the park, then you play Kragic. For me, Bone had a decision not to play Kragic when you're playing this system. If you if you were going to play a more advanced system, then you play Atkinson. I just feel like Graham Arnold doesn't know the strengths of his players, as we saw with playing Kyle Rouse and Milos Degenek when you had the onus of playing out from the back. When you had the onus of playing out from the back, especially through the middle, not playing Stesnes is mind-boggling to me. But with saying this, you can't say that Graham Arnold got it wrong because we won. And as much as I as much as I put a bet on the UAE to win, and as much as I was probably the most unconfident I've ever been going into a must win game for the Socceroos in a long time, you got to give credit to Arnie because the system he played worked. Now, will it work again? I don't know. Do we need to be to be great? You need to take risks. You can't play this way of football forever. This really just stagnant, kind of hoping for individual brilliance type football, and we saw that. I mean, our, got, our first goal came from Martin Boyle doing what Martin Boyle does best because Martin Boyle is very good at football. And then our second goal came from Adrian Herstich doing what Adrian Herstich does best because Adrian Herstich is very good at football. Um... It's not going to work forever. You're not going to be able to get individual brilliance forever, and you're going to be able to have to break teams down. And we, we weren't able to break the UAE down. The UAE, however, were able to break the Socceroos down countless times through exploiting that gap from Nathaniel Atkinson and Bailey Wright. However, the Socceroos don't know how to exploit space. The soccer is, that was one of the key reasons why I also wanted the 4-2-3-1 system because when we play the 4-2-3-1 system, it plays almost as a 4-2-4. And you can kind of see it here. You can kind of see something along the lines of a 4-2-4 with Goodwin, Leckie, Hustich, Boyle to an extent. But the fact that none of them are natural strikers, the fact that none of them were instructed to play it explicitly in a 4-2-4 system didn't allow to be fulfilled, if you were to call it that. So the UAE, it was tactically brilliant brilliant from them to be able to exploit space. The Socceroos weren't able to exploit space at all. And I feel like when you're coming up, especially Peru, who are going to look to dominate the ball against us, you're going to need to find a way to exploit space, especially when you have possession, especially when you have possession. Find a weakness and target it. The Socceroos didn't find a weakness. It was kind of, uh, we're just really confused. Just find, just someone pick up the ball and someone score. That was kind of the, the modus operandi from the Socceroos, which I felt it was. There was no no emphasis on exploiting space. There was no emphasis on breaking the UAE down tactically. So, yeah, those were my two cents on the game. I don't, yeah. I mean, it, it, it was a game which I didn't really care about how we played to an extent. Obviously, I'd want to see Australia play good football, but it was just about it winning. 
Oh, God. Um, it was just about winning. And we did that in... You can't call it convincing fashion because it definitely wasn't that. But you also can't call it bad fashion because, I mean, if we just go back here and we look at the momentum bar, you can say that... If you look at the momentum bar on the left-hand side of your screen, you can say that, yes, in the first maybe 60 minutes... It was ebbing and flowing, ebbing and flowing. And then what you can see here, once we scored the goal, we did kind of tail off. And even before we scored the goal, we kind of tailed off. But in the last half an hour, it was dominance. It was utter dominance. And, I mean, you've got to give credit to Graham Arnold for that. You've got to give credit to to the players. You've got to give credit to everyone involved because they could have quite easily, maybe not down tools because I feel like you expect more from your players. You don't want them to down tools. But you would not blame them for just putting the foot off the pedal and just kind of seeing the game out towards the back end of it. But they, we got the job done. Thank God for that. Thank Christ for Adj and her stitch. Got the job done. Let's hope tar uh, tar target, target and Sainsbury back for the Peru game. And let's just win that game. I, I this, is the, this is a game against Peru, which the performance means probably as little as anything would ever mean to me. Just win. Please just win. It could be 1-0 in the 90th minute. It could be 16-0 by half time. We could win. We could have 50 shots. We could have 3 shots. We could have 1% possession. We could have 100% possession. Just win the game. I don't care how you do it. I don't care if you're going to play Mitchell Duke and fucking bring back Josh Kennedy out of retirement and play them both up front and just lump balls into the box. I don't care what you're going to do. Just win the game. Is there some... Some road no someone's moving their bin outside I think um, apology for that apology if, if that comes through on the mic but yeah just win just win the game next week that's all I would ever ask and yes I did so for those in, for I mentioned it before but I did put a bet on the UAE to win this was more to cover my base as well as me being not confident however I will be putting a bet on the on Peru to win. And for those who understand a bit of sporting psychology, you know why I put Peru uh, the bet on for Peru to win. But let's just hope the Socceroos get it done. Let's just hope that I can sit here in a week's time and talk about how I'll be waking up at 4 o'clock in the morning to watch Australia versus France in Qatar and not, and not be heartbroken. Because I was lucky enough to be born in an era where I've only seen Australia make World Cups. I was lucky enough not to be... I was lucky enough not to experience the heartbreak of Montevideo in 2001, the heartbreak of Iran in 1997, the heartbreak of Scotland, the heartbreak of Argentina. However, I was... I have I've been lucky enough to experience the 2010 World Cup. Obviously, 2006 as well, but I was two, so I don't really remember the whole, a whole lot. Um... Obviously, 2010 World Cup, 2014 World Cup, and the 2018 World Cup. I don't want to live in a, in a world where Australia don't make the World Cup. Because a sh football in this country is on its knees. And this was such a massive win for this country. Such a massive win for this country. People underestimate. But this was, this was such an important win for this country. So... I'm happy that we got it done. Really happy we got it done. Um, I think that's enough talk of that. We've spoken about for 20 minutes on that game. So, like I said, short episode. It's the off season. Just going to quick, 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 smart episodes. 20 minutes. Watch it on the train to work if you want. Um, so, yeah, I just want to get into to some transfer news. I'm just going to speak about these for about a minute each because I don't really care. And also, there will be no who went into footed. There will be no proper structure to these type of episodes. It will just be me chatting the shit about the football that happened and specific games that happened. So, yes, I'll be here next Monday for the Socceroos vs Peru. I'll either be very upset or very happy. You'll either get a comprehensive review or you'll get me crying for 40 minutes. I mean, it's it's a luck of the draw, really. Um, so, yeah, let's just touch on some transfer news ever so briefly because I feel like it's good to just update. we obviously got... Robert Lewandowski leaving Bayern Munich in very tumultuous circumstances. Spoken out about him, spoken about, spoken out about the club very vocally um, in some interviews. That which surprised me. I thought he was going to stay in, to Bayern Munich for the foreseeable future, but quite clearly that's not the case. 
Um, obviously, you got Paul Pogba leaving Manchester United. Obviously, oh wait, can I just say Lewandowski? I don't, I don't have a clue where he's going to go. I can't see him going to Italy. I can't see him going coming to the Prem. I can't see him going to. I can't see him going to, um, Spain. Is it an MLS job? Is it? Is it back to Borussia Dortmund? Is it? Uh, who knows what it is? I actually have no idea where where he's going to go because. Because I don't, I don't see him fitting in anywhere else. He's played in Germany for the best part of his whole career, so I don't, I don't necessarily think he can fit in any other, any in, in any other league. Um, as my camera is having a poor focus, focus on me, please, camera. You know what? Yeah, it's good enough. Um, so yes, poor Pogba leaving Manchester United. There's a couple of suitors available for him. Juventus is one. I don't think he should go back to Juventus. Real Madrid is one. I don't think he should go to Real Madrid. And PSG is one. I think that's probably the best of the available bunch. Can go there. Obviously, the money is not going to be an issue. The only issue from a PSG perspective is the egos. It's going to be a massive just dick measuring contest between Messi, Mbappe, Neymar, and Pogba. So... I mean, if I mean, unless Zidane goes, because I feel like Zidane's probably the only manager in world football that can demand respect from all four of those players. So unless Zidane goes there, and obviously you'd think Pogba's mates with Mbappe, so that helps as well. Um, and then obviously Chouameni goes to Real Madrid. They're building some sort of fucking midfield. Can I just say they won the Champions League in their midfield for the next decade? Is Camavinga, Chouameni, and Valverde? Jesus Christ. Anyways. Anyways, enough of that. I just I am crying at the at the thought of coming up against that mid, that, that midfield in the Champions League. Um, yeah, that's going to be good fun. Not. Um, yeah. So thank you guys all very much for watching. Short episode, brief episode. Just wanted to touch on the soccer league game as well. Some European transfers. Um, yeah. So I'll be back next Monday definitely. If something big happens between now and then, I'll be back. If something big happens after Monday afternoon, I'll be back after that as well. Um, but keep keep on the socials. Twitter is basically where you'll get me updating properly. TF, 2FT pod on Twitter. 2 Foot Attacker podcast on Instagram and TikTok. Then 2 Foot Attacker podcast on, obviously, all the audio platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Anchor. Just Even if you don't listen, just go and like f- follow it or subscribe to it and just give it a five-star rating because, I mean... Why not? It will make it make me feel good. Um, and then obviously on YouTube, leave uh, subscribe to the YouTube, YouTube channel, Two Foot Tackle Podcast. Um, like all the podcasts, like all the clips, notification bell, all that good stuff. Thank you guys very much for watching. See you guys next time. Um, goodbye.